All right, this is Boxing with the Truth, and I am the Truth. Today is August 27, 2015, and today we have with us Paul, the Marin County Assassin, Nave. How you doing? I'm doing good, John. How are you? I'm good. I appreciate you taking time out to do the interview. I know you're a busy guy, so let's get right to it. Um, I know you fought at Welterweight, and uh, you actually debuted back in 1985. And uh, you just recently retired just this past January, right? Yeah, I fought on and off for 30 years. I did. I turned pro in 1985. And actually, I was a uh, junior welterweight then, or what they call now, super lightweight, 140. And uh, then after a few years there, uh, from 85, gosh, I believe it was around 87 is finally when I uh, went welterweight. Okay, and you retired at 51 years old, right? Um, actually... 54. 54? <laughs> my last fight was this year, January 30th, 2015. I was 54 years old. Wow, that's pretty impressive. And you actually, uh, but no. through your career though, you held the IBO Intercontinental Super Lightweight title, title in 97, you won it, and then you actually beat Greg Hagen for the WBF Welterweight title in 98, right? Yeah, it's Greg Hagen. Or Hagen? Yeah, he's from Auburn, Washington. And I fought him three times, and I defeated him the first time on ESPN, March 27th, uh, 1998. And then we fought twice more, and he won by one round in the split decision in the second fight. And the third and final fight was a draw. First of all, I want to let everybody know your pro record act, 20 wins, 8 knockouts, 10 losses, 2 draws. Uh, more or less. There, there's one fight, but it basically is tw uh, 20 wins. Ten losses with eight knockouts and there's three draws, uh, but they have it down as two and one no contest. And the bummer is my third and final fight, and I was obviously fine. Uh, and that was, gosh, that was December, December uh, 1999, my third and final fight with Greg Hogg. And he came up uh, dirty for pot and methamphetamine in his butt. And so they made a no contest because he came up dirty, but I didn't. So it's kind of a bummer that he's making a no contest. But that's life. What can you do? So let's start from the beginning. How did you get involved in boxing to begin with? Oh, boy. Uh, you know, in 19... Oh, what year was that? When I was in eighth grade, I switched schools from a Catholic school, San Rafael's in San Rafael. Went to this Davidson Junior High um, in San Rafael, public school. And when I transferred there, there was a few uh, kids that were boxing in the basement of a guy's house. And there was a rumor if you did uh, 100 sit-ups, with a 10 pound weight behind your head, you'd buy your banana split. So I think it was more for the banana split at the beginning. But anyhow, you know, I wanted to learn self-defense and and, uh, and I enjoyed, you know, uh, the type of sports that challenge you. And uh, so I started going with a couple buddies to the basement of his house and uh, learned all the basics, you know, all the, you know, the basic boxing uh, skills. And I uh, got that banana split, of course. <laughs> Guy named Jack McPhee. He was uh, he had a plumbing company, and right out of like I said, his basement, he uh, trained a whole bunch of us young boys. Uh, back, gosh, that would have been oh boy, in the seventies, you know, you know late sixties. Uh, so was that before you started wrestling and playing football, or was that after that? Because I know you were a pretty good wrestler too, right? I, I was actually a better wrestler than a boxer. I would have been perfect for MMA had they had it when I was younger. Now, boy, those life enduring injuries, no thanks. Uh, but uh, anyhow, in, in, uh, see, in high school, I wrestled in the eighth grade at that Davidson once, and, then one, and that was more intramural sport, part of PE. But then in high school, that was my main sport. I did football and wrestling and even baseball the first year as a freshman. But uh, I did wrestling and uh, did that. That was my main sport through all through high school. And I was a three time league champion in wrestling and two time. Uh, captain and most viable wrestler and won a lot of different tournaments and uh anyhow yeah that was that was my gig so how was your amateur boxing career well it was, it was ironic I, I did well you know i uh, won the golden gloves twice i mean uh, here in marin or marin county that's where i'm from but uh the golden gloves is in san francisco they used to have what they called the examiner golden gloves which was really big in the bay area and uh, my very first time I went, you had to be 16 years old. So 
So when I started at 14, just learning the basics in that basement, uh, it was a couple of years before I could actually participate in the Golden Gloves, like I said, because you had to be 16. And when I was 16, I uh, went into it, and uh, heck, they had like 14 guys in weight back then. Big difference to now. And uh, I won the whole thing. I had to shoot box every night, even during the day, because there were so many kids uh, fighting back then. And, and, you know, I, I was a novice division, but I won the whole thing uh, that first year. And that basically they sell that place out, 16,000 people back then, they, you know, on finals night. They said a lady named uh, Carol Dota, who had a big strip club there <laughs> in San Francisco. And, uh, and Kenny Stabler used to sit in front row. And it was a pretty neat, you know, exciting time back then. Okay, so now you become a pro, you're a pro for a couple years, and I just want to touch on this briefly. Then you end up going to San Quentin Prison, sentenced to six years, but you served three for, for dealing cocaine, right? Yeah, what happened was, I mean, I was a hard worker and uh, busted my butt all the time, and, and during uh, those years, I got involved in uh, selling cocaine at one time. And I had never been in jail in my life, but unfortunately, uh, they had the war on drugs at that time, and uh, they sent me to St. Quentin. And it was a six-year sentence I received, but because of uh, staying out of trouble and uh, you know good behavior and all that, and also by working, you have to actually work to get you know time off your sentence. But yeah, I worked in good behavior, and I got out in half time in three years. But I mean, that was, that was actually 1990 that I went in and got out in '93. So how does a guy go from uh, pro boxing and, and being in San Quentin prison, which is one of the worst prisons in the United States? I mean, you've done so much in a career besides boxing. I mean, you were a stock trader. You, you owned a limousine service. I'm, I know you had your pilot license. I don't know if you still do. Uh, I know you've been on, you, you had your own reality show. You had a, a tax preparation and mortgage lending company. You even recorded a rap song, correct? <laughs> I did, I did, a couple of them, matter of So fact. now are you, uh, here's what I need to know though, are you considered white tea? Is that your, are you white tea in the, in the white tea white and the tea, Mac Daddies? White tea and the Mac Daddies, I'm white tea. You can see fast white, white tea. That's, <laughs> that's, me. that's great, man. I mean, you even, uh, you've done so much, you even recorded a rap song. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell you how all that happened. And I went there, like, to see, I had a limousine service uh, from 83 to 1990. And started from scratch, working my way up, bought new cars, got loans, etc. Worked hard, and uh, and I also on the side there got involved in the cocaine, got myself in trouble. And like I said, I never been in county jail in my life, and they sent me straight to the, the pen, as they say. And that was in 1990. So in 1990, I you know ended up. My mom took over my limousine service for a few years there, and then ended up selling it. I went into San Quentin and a uh, whole new reality. So now, do you have a do you have a do you have a um, degree in anything or do you in business or anything? Because I mean, how do you do all this stuff with, without any schooling? Do you have a degree? Well, I went I, I went to uh, Tampa High School, graduate high school, and then I actually went to SF State, San Francisco State, and on a scholarship from wrestling, uh, but only went a semester. I ended up during the Christmas break, uh, my car got totaled. And so yeah, it was horrible and uh, ended up finishing the semester out, but never went back to school. Ended up getting a job driving trucks for a produce company and got in the union as a young guy and making a lot of good, you know, making good money and never went back to school. But my thing was, my, I, my uh, thing I wanted to do in school anyhow was uh, business. And, uh, and my own dad was a businessman. And my buddy's friends were businessmen. And anyhow, I lived it. So, uh, and, you know, I ended up working for the post company for about three years and then uh, transferred over by limousine and started my own limousine business. Okay, so you also have a real estate license as well, too, or you used to, right? Yeah, yep, still do. I still have a real estate license. And right now, I have Navi tax preparation. I'm not doing the mortgage loans right now. I'm just uh, you know concentrating on the taxes. And I'm possibly going to open up a sports bar. I'm looking at a lot of different opportunities. But... Uh, you know, right now, like I said, the tax preparation business is my main business. So explain to me how you go from all this type of stuff to get involved in the rap game and record a rap song. <laughs> well, let me tell you, when I was in San Quentin, you know, it's a whole other world in there. But you just got to get through it. And uh, I went through it, and I actually fought out of here. I fought out of San Quentin, which probably never happened again. Years ago, before I was in San Quentin, they used to have a boxing team. They actually, you know, brought in certain teams, and they had fights. 
But anyhow, that was over for years. And uh, right before I went into San Quentin, uh, I went in in San uh, Cyr. It was June, June, late June, June 27th, 1990. And I had fought in March of 1990 at the Veterans Hall and knocked out a guy named Michael Lloyd from Oakland. And then you know, I'd been, you know, I'd been fighting as a professional. And I didn't know if I was going to go in up going to see a prison for sure or not, but unfortunately that's where they sit. And while I was in there, the war, my, I ended up working in an area called in-service training, IST. And I was uh, the main guy there that kind of ran things for the lieutenant. And he was a big boxing fan. We used to talk and then he talked to the warden and started looking at an opportunity, maybe have this guy fight and get back to the community. And they check with, you know, different politicians locally in the newspapers and a lot of people, you know, supported it and thought it would be a great idea to give back. And anyhow, so I ended up actually fighting out there in 1991, September 91, and uh, <laughs> I ended up knocking a guy out. And, and I'll never forget when I was at the prison, I had a guy named Jack McPhee and Mo Smith were the promoters. And I asked Jack McPhee, I said, Jack, who am I fighting? And he said, we well, were fighting a guy named Enrique Moreno from Caldwell, Idaho. Oh. What's his record of six and all? And I said, oh, okay. Uh, how many knockouts? Six. I said, thanks a lot, Jack. <laughs> you give me a guy six, there was six knockouts. And I got to face 5,600 inmates if I lose. But anyhow, I was fortunate enough. I got out there and uh, ended up knocking him out in the first round. But so how did the how did the white tea and the rapping thing come about? <laughs> okay. <No. laughs> While in prison, there was a few things. I mean... When you're in prison, you know, one of the biggest things is you don't want to, you know, end up doing the same type of things or the same thinking that he got you into San Quentin. And so while in Quentin, you know, I had, there was four main things I really worked on and the things that I wanted to do when I got out. And one of them was uh, get out and chase a dream and fight for a world title. You know, because I had never given it full time. I was always kind of half-assed, but also they'd say, oh, you got to fight. And I mean, I'd train for six weeks, train my ass off. Like, whatever I was doing, I'm drinking, having fun. I'd stop full turkey, train for six weeks, and I'd fight. That's kind of how it used to be. And that would be like, all of a sudden, I'd fight. And then a year later, I'd fight. Eight months, I'd fight. A year and a half, I'd fight. It was just on and off. And I didn't really take it seriously, but I was so successful. Um, but anyhow, so one of the, the ideas was I'm going to chase a dream fight for a world title. Uh, one of the other things was I owned this property in San Anselmo and I was going to get out and uh, build my dream home. Uh, another funny thing, <laughs> believe it or not, was there was a thing called, uh, in, in prison, they're called spreads. And what it really is, is top ramen soup, but you get rid of the water and you have the noodles, and then you mix it with ch chicken chunks and oysters and mayonnaise and jalapeno peppers. And anyhow, one of the funny things was the jalapeno peppers they had them in cans, you know, so they didn't last very long once you used them. And then on top of that, you can have a knife in prison, so you can't really cut them. So you have to use your hands and break them apart. Anyhow, you touch your eyes later, even after you wash them, they're stinging. So one of my ideas was when I get out, I'm going to sell jalapeno peppers to the state prisons in California. And, uh, and you know, I'll pack them in jars. They're pretty plastic. They can see through and see that there's no contraband inside other than jalapenos. They'd be all pre-sliced. And be perfect, <laughs> so they can store them, and uh, they're already cut for them. Anyhow, and that's exactly what I did too when I got out. I uh, formed a Johnson Food Products and sold jalapeno peppers to the prisons. And then one of the fourth and final things was I was there was a a rap about you know fat girls while in prison, a comical rap about fat girls, and uh, it was developed at San Quentin. And uh, I used to, you know, do it. And a whole bunch of guys, you got to put that on wax. You got to put that on wax. And I record it. And so, anyhow, when I got out, that's the other fourth and final thing I had to do. And ironically, I had started out of a friend who put some money up to have a guy, a guy read in the newspaper, local newspaper, that was coming back to fight after I got out of San Quentin. And one of the things was I had put that I'm going to, uh, you know, that I had this rap song I wanted to you know, produce and record. And so somebody saw that and contacted me, and I had to go to his house, and, and he was doing, you know, the recording and all the stuff. And, and uh, you know, sadly, he ends up, he's going to do a thousand, uh, back then, a thousand cassettes and a thousand CDs and all this, and, and uh, mix it and all that stuff. And the bottom line is I had a buddy put up some money that helped us at the time, you know, to buy all the CDs and, uh, and the cassettes, but the guy ran off with the money. You know, and then he offered to redo it, never did. 
that was the fourth and final thing that I had never finished. But in 2010, during the reality show that I did, it was 10 half-hour episodes on Comcast Sports Hit. And uh, anyhow, I uh, finished the reality, I mean, I finished the rap song, had it recorded, and anyhow, it's actually that there's a song called Prison, and there's a song called Fat Girls about White Tea and the Mac Daddies. And uh, anyhow, it's on Apple, and uh, I'm also on Amazon. <laughs> it's on, it's on iTunes, too. Yeah, iTunes, under Apple iTunes, and uh, Amazon, and a whole bunch of different websites. But anyhow, it's yeah, Fat Girls and uh, my White Tea and the Mac Daddies. Yep, I listened to both of them this morning. <laughs> you know how to spell a white tea in the Mac Daddy. <laughs> <laughs> also, um, a lot of people well might know out in California, but a lot of other boxing fans might not know that you actually ran for governor of California in 2003, right? Well, well here's what happened. You know, back in 19, oh boy. Or was I it? No, no, wasn't it? Was it? What year was that in? It was it? It wasn't 2003, oh, was it? No, 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 no. That, I think it was 2003, was there, or four, let's see here, for governor. But I actually ran for state assembly. I ran for state okay. assembly in, in California and got over 9,000 votes. And a guy named Joe Nation won, but there was about, you know, eight different people running at that time. But I did real well. I said over 9,000 votes, and uh, and uh, he won. I don't know what he won with, 12,000 or something. But Joe Nation won. And then later, I ended up running for governor in what they call the recall election. And that's what Arnold Schwarzenegger won. But it was a recall election, uh, and uh, unfortunately, <laughs> there was a million people, not a million, but a lot of people running for governor then. And my, my thing was, I ran for governor, it was more to get the name recognition and all that for when I ran for state assembly again. But uh, it, life has its way of screwing things up, and I decided I never got around to running for office again. Did you know at one time you were the older, oldest professional welterweight boxer in the world? I don't know about the world, but I know as far as sanctions, I mean, you know, sanctions by the Athletic Commission in California, I maturely at 54 years old last year, or this year, actually, January of this year, at 54, I would have been the oldest. And, and when I was 52, I was one of the oldest also, and that was two years ago when I fought Albert Park. Okay, because I, I, I read it was in the world. Oh, well, it might be at 50, 54 years old. Yeah, as far as a sanction, about, possibly. Yeah, there's not a lot of welterweights that are 54. <laughs> not fighting professionally still, no. <laughs> also, you you did talk, you did bring up the reality show. I want to talk about that real quick so people understand. How did you end up being on a reality show or having a reality show? Well, what happened is a lot of times when I had these fights coming up, the newspapers and the local uh, TV stations, you know, would contact me and want to cover it. And uh, Channel Four, Kwan, there was a a gentleman there. <laughs> Excuse me one second. Anyhow. Um, at the time, um, oh boy, let's see, what year was that? I'm just trying to remember what year. Um, uh, Vern Glenn, and yeah, Vern Glenn from Channel 4, Cron, uh, was covering me, and he wanted to cover one of my fights, and this is when I came back after 10 years, and that's a, that's a real long story, too. Let me, let me start from one other spot to get there. When, uh, I fought Hogan, beat him on, uh, ESPN in 1998. And then lost by one point in the split season in the uh, second fight. Had a draw in the third fight. The reason after that draw, I retired. And that was, like I said, uh, December 1999. And the reason I had to retire, right before the last fight, I fought the some Bramble. And before the Bramble fight, and I ended up losing the Bramble fight. But before the Bramble fight, I was working out with an old wrestling coach. Uh, that he was a wrestling coach for one of the other schools in my um, county here and with a great guy named Chris Fetter and I was doing squats 380 pounds or so free weights and they all ended up blowing out two discs in my back and right before the Bramble fight and I don't blame it on that but I just I got caught and that's the way it goes you know but anyhow the minute the Bramble fight was over I had to get surgery I had got cortisone shots to get to the fight I got surgery for the for the back and then you know to fix the problem the 280 discs and uh and unfortunately, <laughs> a little while after that uh, surgery, you know, I figured it was time to start straightening up my back about a month and a half after I got the surgery. And I started cutting all this rebar for a new wall for my new house that I was building. And I uh, ended up re-herniating the two discs in my back. 
and and we've been trying to get Hogan in the third and final fight too, and he took a fight somewhere else, even though we had a contact fight when I had lost a split decision, but I never sued him or whatever, just let it go. But anyhow, then they finally called on the fight. They were at a herniated disc, and uh, anyhow, I was gonna fight him anyhow, and I got cortisone shots and went through with the fight and did my best and fought actually really well. You know, I thought I, I had won, and matter of fact, Mr. Graham was there at the fight, he told me I kicked his ass, you know, and I thought I beat him pretty well too, but they had taken a point off for me, in towards the back of the head, and and, uh, and then I got knocked out of the 12th and final round, but those extra points is what helped him get a draw, so he ended up with a draw. And uh, anyhow, <laughs> that, that's uh, that's what happened. I had to retire again the second time, you know, because I had re-earned it, re-earned it was this after the Hogan fight, and uh, I had retired. And it was a bummer to me that I had to retire after 10 years of fighting. Uh, not 10 years, shoot. I don't know see what year was that, 2000. That was uh, 15 years. But anyhow, I had to retire and uh, because of the hernia disc. And I told myself my back never healed properly, that I was going to come back and uh, go out on my own terms and see if I can win 20 fights and or get another shot at a world title. And it only took 10 years, but 10 years after I retired, at the hog of that draw, that third and final draw, I came back and uh, won four straight fights. Uh, and, uh, and then, and then I'm trying to remember in the, let's see here, three, four, yeah, and then the fifth, the sixth, seventh. Anyhow, I ended up on June 4th, 2010, I was gonna fight a guy named uh, Daniel Slims from your state there in Minnesota. Matter of fact, Duluth, Minnesota, the same area. Yep, Duluth, Minnesota, same city. Yeah. And uh, I was going to fight him, um, but uh, the, we uh, we set that up for June fourth, two thousand and ten. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, Channel Four Crime. Well, when I was when I was training, they wanted to cover me, and uh, so <coughs> excuse me. Um, Vernon Lynn that worked for him, he, he uh, wants to cover me. It's like two days for a fight, or no, three days for a fight. I said, Vern, I am so busy. I got a million things to do. I got to pick up money for the tickets. I got to get the tickets to the county and uh, blah, blah, blah. So anyhow, he, he said, oh, no problem, Paul. I'll just follow you. So anyhow, Vernon Lynn came with me that day and followed me. And here I am. I, I trained my ass off. And I went to pick up money and tickets and dropped off tickets and anyhow had to do all these different things and he just at the end of the day he says oh my god i cannot believe all the stuff he does for motor plus training i don't know how you do it i can't i'm exhausted just watching it and anyhow i said yeah make a hell of a reality show people have no idea what goes on behind the scenes to promote a fight train for a fight and anyhow uh he knew some of the Comcast, made some calls, and the, the Comcast was interested in it, and I talked to him, and anyhow, we ended up doing a reality show. It was uh, 10 uh, half-hour episodes, and uh, went to like 5 million households, the Dish Network, Dish Network and uh, the Satellite, and uh, Comcast Sports at Bay Area, which is uh, most of California, just north of LA, and all, you know, two-thirds of California and all of Nevada, in little other areas, but anyhow, yeah, it was uh, it was a lot of fun, you know. It was a lot of work too, but uh, yeah, we did ten uh, ten episodes, and that that actually that reality show was about me being a single dad coming after ten, after ten years coming back to boxing, t- chase a dream of winning twenty fights and or another shot at a world title. But again, being a single dad and uh, and also being the promoter of the fight and training for the fight. And, uh, and, it, and it came to, uh, how you say, the 10 episodes came to an end with the actual fight being the last episode. That was against, you know, Slings. Everything was taped uh, basically one week in advance every single time. It was just, we did it as we were training, as we were working, as we were getting ready for the fight and promoting the fight. It was uh, all being done as we did it. And then within a week after, every week, we'd hand in the uh, tape. You know, a lot of times these companies they'll do it a year in advance or you know they get it all done and edited and everything else we were doing it weekly it was crazy so now uh, when you did, fought daniel slims how did that got hooked up through john hoffman or what yeah, john hoffman yeah he actually uh set that up i i had actually fought daniel in november of uh let me see here um it was in 2009 and uh 
and won a decision. And uh, ironically, I think it was mentioned to you, I talked to you before on the phone, that there was a girl that worked for us and drove and she had said, the you know, hog says, you know, if I, I could have gotten better shape and I could have beat that guy, you know, I didn't think he'd uh, last that long. You know, he thought because of my age, I was going to run out of gas. And so I always remember that. It doesn't matter. People, they all talk things, you know, after they win or lose, um, especially when they lose. But uh, anyhow, when I did the reality show, the worst thing that could ever happen is somebody does a good license last minute or there's problems. So you want to make sure you got a good license fighter to fight. You know, and uh, he had showed up. John Hoffman was a man of his word, who was his manager or trainer, and uh, they showed up. And so we decided to, to fight uh, Daniel Slims on that, in the reality show, on that 10th and final, you know, um, episode. But anyhow, it was through John Hoffman. And they showed up, and, and it was a good fight. And I was fortunate enough in the third round to knock him out and won the fight. All right, so I want to ask you one more thing. I understand that uh, you've sparred with some uh, pretty big names, uh, Mayweather and Chavez. Is that true? Yeah, I actually sparred with Cesar Chavez right before he fought Oscar De La Hoya the first time, and that was up in uh, Caesars Lake Tahoe in California. And I also uh, fought or sparred, excuse me, with Floyd Mayweather, and uh, that was in 1999, and that was up at Big Bear, and he was getting ready to fight Justin Juco. But those are a couple of the big, big names. And, and also we'll spar with Tony Lopez, who we actually fought together on a couple of cards. And I uh, sparred with Mark Breland before in the uh, old car when he was getting ready to fight De La Hoya. But anyhow, yeah, I had some you know, great guys to work with to spar with and former world champions. And the big thing was, you know, I got in that ring, you know, I held my own. You know, I did all right. And Grant, you, uh, the first time when I spar with Julio Caesar, he already went like six rounds, you know. But I went in there and I moved a lot and moved quick and threw quick punches. And, but I mean, I actually uh, did well. And the you know, interesting thing was that uh, being in that ring and not getting ran out of that ring both the wrong, it gave me the confidence that I knew. I absolutely knew one day that I could do it too. If I trained hard enough and uh, it really worked, you know, to uh, get the shape that, it's, that it takes, uh, that I wanted to too, could be a world champion. Okay, well, listen, uh, I want to give you a chance to thank your fans and your supporters before we end the interview. Yeah, no problem. I, I, I totally thank my fans and all my sponsors, you know, very much. Without them, we never could have had all these fights that we had and were in. And I just want to know one thing. When I fought, I fought. I left a little of my life in that ring. No matter if I trained four weeks or four months, I gave it my all, always. All right, and the truth has spoken. <laughs>